So now I would like to introduce our main speaker That's today, right. and I am I'm really excited to do this because, uh, well, Jacqueline is awesome. Come on up, Jacqueline. Uh, she uh, received her doctorate in applied developmental psychology from Claremont Graduate University, but long before that, I met her at Woodbury University, uh, where you had dual majors in psychology and fashion design. So she's just awesome all around. Um, and. Um, her areas of interest, uh, research interest include, I can do this, sensory perception, self-regulation, resilience, and, wait, give me a second, wait. I'm getting there. Um, shoot, no, <laughs> that would have helped. And, oh, the biopsychosocial implications of trauma. Yes. <laughs> give it up for Jacqueline Christensen. All right. Good morning. Good morning. You guys are so responsive. It's fabulous. Usually I have to do it like three times because everyone's sort of melting into chairs and it's five minutes in. All right. So I will learn this clicking mabob. Nope. It's too far. There we go. All right. How many of you have ever tried to take care of an orchid? How did that go? So easy, no, no, not so much. Orchids are hard. They need special water and special light and special talking to, and I have to put ice cubes on mine, and now the flowers are dead, and somehow the leaves are still there, and it says something's going to happen in three months, but I don't believe it. So, but I, it, I didn't even want it. It was a gift to my mother who kills plants. I should have just let her keep it, I suppose, but it's fine. So I have an orchid, but they're hard. Now, question two, pull. How many of you have ever tried to kill a dandelion? <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. Some of you it worked. What'd you do? I will. Yeah. What'd you, what? Yeah. Round up? Yeah. Kick it a lot? No. Um, so they're both flowers, right? But. Some are easy to keep alive, and some are very, very difficult to keep alive. And then you have lots of flowers in between. And this is a metaphor for human resilience. Some children, some people are like dandelions. They can, you can, I mean, dandelions don't even need soil. They will grow out of cement in the wall. You have some human beings that anything can happen to them. They go through everything that we would deem terrible, and they come out on top. Right? And they say, we're going to survive, we're going to do it anyway. And then you have some people who are delicate and they are fragile and they have a much harder time dealing with any sort of adversity. Okay? And, and so I want you to keep this flower metaphor as we sort of move forward. Okay? So what is resilience? Resilience is a universal capacity, meaning that everybody has it. It's a misnomer to believe that some people are resilient. People often think of resilience as a noun, and it's not really a noun. It's really more of a verb. Okay? It's something we're all doing. We're all trying really hard to survive. It's an evolutionary adaptation. Um, babies try really hard. What do they do to survive when they come out? Cry. Cry. Yes, they say, I have needs. Meet them. Right? That, that's an evolutionary adaptation to survive. Okay, and so, we, you know, we have more formal definitions. We have slightly less formal definitions. I really like this sort of second long one here. I won't read it to you, but I will highlight some words in there. Rebound is an important word, that idea of being able to bounce back, the idea of being able to adapt, uh, the idea of being able to develop competencies, all of these things despite adversity, okay, despite going through some sort of stress or a stressful life event, okay, or many stressful life events. Um, and, and there are, I mean, there are beautiful quotes in the world um, that, that basically say it's not, it's not a unique quality, it's something that everybody has. And I like this picture of the elephant, a little girl drew this picture and she just says she falls off then gets back on. Right? And that, I feel, is a wonderful embodiment of the concept of resilience. So there are various things that contribute to resilience and, and how we 
progress through life and whether we're a little more dandelion-like or a little more orchid-like. Um, and, and so we have what we call risk factors and protective factors. And I'm sure some of you have heard of these things. Maybe you haven't. Um, so risk factors is anything, as it sounds, puts us at risk, uh, for, for potential, um, it gets in the way of our success. I should put it that way. It, gets in the, it, get, it impedes our progress. And protective factors are anything that buffer against those risk factors. So if we're defining protective factor, it's a buffer. Okay? And so I've given you several categories here. And instead of filling it with words, I decided to put some pictures. But I'll walk you briefly through each of those categories. So on the individual level, you have risk factors. And those are, are they could be genetic variations. They could be, let's say you were, have a gen genetic predisposition toward depression or you have some sort of physical disability, or um, you have a temperament, you tend to be more uh, sensitive or quiet, and you happen to have ended up in a household that is loud and unctuous, and <laughs> you, you don't feel like you fit in very well. Okay. Um, so know that all of these things are going to work together. Your, your individual protective or risk factors are going to work in the context of your family and in the context of your environment. So you have individual risk factors and you have individual protective factors. So an individual protective factor might be that you are more like a dandelion or um, we're going we're gonna to go over some very specific ones shortly. Um, but I want to take a minute to also talk to you about this idea of person environment interaction. Um, how many of you have heard of epigenetics? Nice. All right. Well, good. Then I don't have to. What smart crowd? Yeah, excellent. Well, you, you guys all know this then, so you can you can you can come back in like thirty seconds when I'm done talking about it. Um, so epigenetics, epi meaning epigenome above the genome. This has to do with though we we do have genetic code that comes with us when we're born. You can think of those as like railroad tracks that are laid, right? And we do have that. But our epigenome is like the little, um, the little mechanics that will let you change tracks. So you wanted to go this way, and then a little switch goes, and you actually end up going this way. Our epigenome helps effectively change which genes are expressed and which ones are not. So what's kind of cool is even though we may come with a particular genetic, uh, set of genetics, those can be shifted and changed throughout our lifespan, depending on the experiences that we have. Okay. Um, and this is through, often through a process of what's called methylation, but I'm not going to get deeply into that at the moment. I will say, however, they've done some really cool research. Uh, Meany and Sif have done some really awesome research uh, where they looked at rat pups and they put some of the rat pups with a good mom. Well, a good mom had some rat pups and then sort of a, a bad mom, a bad mom being she doesn't lick her pups. Bad mom has some pups, they look at stress in the pups later. Obviously, the pups who didn't get licked are stressed. Then they say, well, what if we switch them? What if we put the pups from the, the sort of not paying attention mother with the good mother? And then everything sort of works out, and that's good. But they say, well, then, you know, it, you guys are familiar with nature versus nurture debate. They would say, well, then, you know, one for nurture. Well, then they, uh, they, they did it, um, they did the switching again, but then they, uh, injected a particular chemical into the brains of the rats who had been stressed out and all the effects went away. And so they were like, huh, one for nature then. Uh, and it's to say that it's both, it's very much both, but the idea that our environment impacts our biology, it impacts the chemicals in our brains. So we could even come out more dandelion-like and just through a bunch of situations sort of end up a little bit more orchid-like. So it's, it's significantly more complex than I can cover in 15 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so then you have, again, family factors. So clearly being in any sort of um, stressful family environment is going to be a risk factor. Being in a supportive family is going to be a protective factor. Um, it does take a village. Right? We do know that the more people there are, the better. Um, not when resources are limited, though, then there, there is a balance. Um, 
similarly, school and work, having friends versus being bullied or something like that at school, as well as in the community, if you live somewhere with a lot of community violence or you feel unsafe. Um, another brief aside that I will tell you about is, have you guys, are you familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Boom, one person, yes. So in my very brief aside on that one, um, Vincent Felitti uh, and Dr. Robert Onda did a study at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. They had a sample size of 17,000 people, which is a really sexy sample size. <sighs> <sighs> Just, that's such a great sample size. And what they were able to find out um, was they, they had uh, the, just, you know, middle class, average people who go to Kaiser fill out surveys about their health and um, ask them 10 questions in addition to why they were there to go to the doctor. And those 10 questions were about emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, having a parent with alcoholism, having parents who divorced, parental loss, um, seeing domestic violence in the house, having a parent who's been incarcerated, and just said, did any of these happen to you before you were 18? And then they added them up. So just if you had two of those things, three of those things, four of those things, et cetera. And if you had four or more of those things, they found that you would get your likelihood of things like heart disease, cancer, uh, various health risks in general, risk for suicide, risk for drug use, went up exponentially. And it, I mean, the graphs are beautiful. And it is correlational, but it's also sort of backwards longitudinal, right? And they were able to track them for a while as well. And they found that even asking the patients about that reduced the return of a doctor's visit in the next year. So just even saying, hey, did any of these things happen to you? Oh, yeah, they did. Thanks for asking, was really important. So this is, you, you have sort of the childhood resilience research meets the, hey, now we see what's happening in adulthood research. And if you, you meet them in the middle, what we know is that everything that's going on in your environment, from the conversations your parents are having to the conversations you're having with your spouse to what's happening in your neighborhood, is not just something that, oh, you can think about sometimes. It's actually affecting you physically, OK? So, it's really important whether it's other, is one of these pointed things? Maybe, I don't know, the purple box. Um, it's really important to be mindful of how various life circumstances are also going to impact us as well. And we, have may, have, you know, we may have been on a trajectory like this and then something kind of happens and knocks us you know, in a completely different direction. And our ability to anticipate that uh, very much matters. So, I will briefly tell you about the Kauai Longitudinal Study, which happened uh, in Kauai, which you've never been to that island, you should totally go. It's my favorite, and you should go. That's, that's, that's the lesson on that one. Um, Emmy Warner and Ruth Smith did a study starting in the, oh goodness, I want to say the 50s. Um, they recruited 680, sorry, 698 children born in Kauai. Um, about a third of them were considered high-risk mothers based on uh, nutrition, low birth weight, poverty, et cetera. Um, and, they, and she followed them. I mean, talk about a career choice. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow people for 40 years. Oh, okay. Well, good. How are you going to fund that? I have no idea. Um, but she did. She's at UC Davis. And um, what's really awesome is so she, she followed them at various time points. And so in adolescence, she was able to look and... And so of that third that were initially high risk, about a third of those were on a pretty good path. And so then you could see there were still two thirds of those that still had some delinquency issues, early teenage pregnancies, mental health issues, et cetera. But then she followed them even more. And when she checked in with them when they were in their 30s, you see that even now two thirds of that original one third were on a pretty good trajectory. So it wasn't like this for lack of a better word, death sentence early on to have had risk factors in early childhood. In fact, they were working it out. And so she said, well, what are some of the things that these folks have got that the other folks haven't got? And we see that they had found some positive relationships. They had found a positive work environment. 
They had perhaps found some sense of spirituality. They had become parents and been like, I got to get my shit together. This was, you know, like, I got to do it better. I have to do it right. So they had found something to, to be able to move forward in that way. So what are some of the personal protective factors that, that we can have? And, and, and it's one thing to sort of look at a list of this like this and go, well, duh, of course, these all make sense. Why? Clearly, if you have these things, you will be doing okay. The reason for, for kind of going back and say, what is it, what are the traits that help make us successful are really going to help us keep these things in mind when we interact with other people. Or if we have children, what can we help instill in our kids? Or if we're volunteering or we're in the Big Brother, Big Sister program or whatever it is, what are some qualities that we can help instill in the next generation? right, or that we can promote with other people. And so, clearly social competence <laughs> is a protective factor. Um, there's a website called Circle of Courage, um, and it's, it's done by a folk of, um, a, a community of various Native American tribes. Um, and when I looked, I, I was trying to look at, at resilience from a cross-cultural perspective, because often when we look at psychological concepts, they're very much done from a white Western culture perspective. And so I said, you know, what does resilience look like across cultures? I think that's really important. And so in these little purple bubbles at the bottom, they also had these sort of four concepts that align really closely with what has been found in the research, which I thought was pretty awesome, because I don't think they talked to each other. I mean, maybe they did, but I don't think they did. And so with social competence, you have generosity, and I love this quote. It's by a Lakota elder, and it says, you should be able to give away your most cherished possession without your heart beating faster. And I, I thought, wow, that is really the essence of social competence, isn't it? Really that the capacity for empathy, um, altruism, being responsive, being aware of somebody else's feelings, being a little bit other-oriented, right? And sort of the... the, the Inverse would be something like selfishness, right? Then problem solving. And so in that tiny picture, which I know should be bigger, is this really cool playland. They make these play worlds now for kids where you can take the entire thing apart and like build your own playground, essentially. It's these blue box. Oh, I want to play with it so bad. But problem solving is really important because it requires planning and flexibility and resources. Um, my dad always said when I was a kid, he said, everything you need is in your reach. And we've had deep metaphorical conversations since then, but he meant that literally because he was an engineer and no matter what you were doing, you could always find what you needed somewhere in your proximity whether it be a rubber band or a piece of string or a paper clip or whatever it is, you're trying to do something and be like, ah, uh, this will work, right? That's flexibility, right? That's problem solving. And so the idea of mastery comes from that circle of courage, okay? So being able to, to be competent and problem solve. Okay, then the other two are autonomy and sense of purpose. So autonomy has to do with being your own person, right? Being able to sort of go out, um, have a positive sense of yourself, um, you have a sense of humor, perhaps. Don't take yourself too seriously. We do find that humor is a huge piece of resilience. Um, independence would be the circle of courage uh, pairing there. And, and they say make choices without coercion. Right, they, they, that you have a sense of making choices, and it seems an odd statement, making choices without coercion, but think of a toddler, right? Often they need a lot of coercion for certain choices. Other ones they're perfectly fine making. Um, but that idea of inner discipline, and again, you can see this principle across the world. Last is sense of purpose, and I'm, I'm clearly preaching to the choir on this one, because you're all here doing something bigger than yourself, which is, again, something when they sort of reverse engineer, who are these dandelions and what are they doing right? One of the things is having a sense of purpose. So 
I, I saw in the slides earlier um, of all the different Sunday assemblies, someone had a close-up of a little card that says, I find blank meaningful. And I thought to myself, that's a wonderful activity for sense of purpose. What do I find meaningful? Why, why do I even do what I do? And I don't want to push anyone into an existential crisis. <laughs> it's okay. We're not, we're not going to go that deeply into why are we here? Not today. Um, but I really, again, the, the circle of cur courage pairing there is belonging. And from a more... Uh, communalistic standpoint as opposed to a more individualistic standpoint, um, that really helps with sense of purpose. It's very hard. I know we, we very much push independence in this country because it, uh, Hofstede's cultural um, categories uh, finds that the United States is the most individualistic country in the world, um, which if you are in favor of this, is awesome. But what we know about social being is that actually it's probably not as awesome as it sounds. And so in order to be successful, we are social animals. We need, we need each other. And so it's very important that we have that sense of belonging, that we feel like we fit in, which again is why most of you are probably here today. Um, and so... Uh, Ella Deloria says, be related somehow to everyone you know, right? And that, that is the essence of belonging and the essence of having a sense of purpose, okay? And, and optimism is part of that as well. So again, that sounds obvious. Well, of course, if you're positive about the world, you have a sense of optimism, but you can actually help build these things in other people. It, it is possible. And how is that possible? Well, it's possible through caring relationships. So it's, so the personal protective factors are all well and good. Those are things inside of us, right? That, that can be groomed and honed, etc. But there's lots of external factors. Remember I mentioned the idea of person, environment, interaction that can help us do that. And so these three things, having caring relationships that include high expectations, okay? and provide us opportunities to contribute are going to help us be successful in that way and help promote resilience in an individual. Um, and I like this, uh, my friend who also does work with me in this area, she talks about turnabout people and that these are, are people who helped you in your life along the way, who helped teach you things like to not take adversity personally because it's not your fault. I mean, you should accept responsibility for certain things, obviously, but, but not to internalize every negative thing that comes at you, right, as, as aimed at you, okay? Not to see adversity as permanent, the idea that this is only temporary, this too shall pass, that sort of thing. And then not to see setbacks as pervasive, okay, that they're always gonna be happening. And again, some of you might say to yourself, well, clearly, I'm, I'm that person. Wonderful, go be that person for somebody else then, right, who may not have those qualities. And, and I want you just to reflect for a moment, who was that somebody for you? I'm sure you all have somebody like that. I mean, who, who was it that gave an Awesome Human Award today? Some, yeah, there you go. She found herself an awesome human, <laughs> right? who clearly is a turnabout person and has some of those qualities and is able to say, hey, you can do this, you got this, right? And, and we love having those, the, those affirmations because again, it helps with that sense of belonging. Um, and, and know that caring relationships, again, are not just sort of a surface thing. There's even a concept called social buffering. Um, Megan Gunner's, Gunner and some others have, have looked at the impact of having somebody else there actually mitigates our physical response to pain and fear. Like it changes our brain and, and, and adrenaline and cortisol and all of that in how we respond to fear, which is why like when babies go get a shot, having somebody there to hold them, it's a good thing, right? Can you even imagine being like, okay, good luck, kid. 
You just put the baby down, walk away, wait for it to happen. Like, no, you would never do that, right? Because you're going to hold that baby and be there for that baby. And in that same sort of way, social buffering is so important when we're going through any sort of trauma. Um, if you really think all this stuff is super cool and interesting, the Harvard Center for the Developing Child has some amazing videos. Um, and they talk about the idea of toxic stress and what goes from manageable stress and turns it into toxic stress, they have whittled it down to an absence of a caring relationship. Okay, so when you have to go it alone, it's actually much more physically damaging to you. Okay. Um, and, and this is important in all contexts, at home, at school, at work, wherever you are, relationships matter. Think if you've ever worked in a place where you didn't have good relationships and how toxic that was for you and how you probably even felt it in your body, right? Like you, I don't want to go to work. Or kids who are bullied at school and they're like, I have a stomach ache today. I can't, I can't do it. it. It does impact us at that level. So across the lifespan, so what do we do with this information? You know, I can, I can tell you like, hey, this is what we know about what should be happening early on. And some of you go, and I'm 60, so what do you want me to do about it? Um, across the lifespan, there's so much we can do about it. So I will wrap up. Um, so across the lifespan, we're able to look at things like um, optimal aging, meaning we have to recover um, the, the, the better we're able to recover and adapt um, to things that happen to us. Um, a lot of that has to do with how we manage stress on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another piece that I will just get to, I know you're going to be curious about suicide rates, so I'll just tell you very quickly. Um, the demographic with the lowest suicide rate is African American women over the age of 65. And what they found is that those women share social belonging, a sense of spirituality, hardiness, the ability to sort of bounce back, and a sense of, well, you just got to keep going. Okay? And so if we, again, reverse engineer that to how can we move forward, if we savor the relationships that we have, if we reflect on them, then we will be better able to make our lives uh, more like dandelions, hopefully nobody's trying to spray Roundup on us, but that we can persevere even in the face of adversity. So that's what I have to say about that. I also have another thing to say. I know, that was the end of, that was part A. Uh, I now briefly have a part B. But I wrote this part. Okay. So one week ago, at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, a very disturbed individual took the lives of 49 other individuals, injured over 50 more, and changed the lives of hundreds of family and friends of those at the club. The LGBTQ and Latino communities experienced senseless loss and a renewed sense of fear and uneasiness. This tragedy is one of many in our country and across the world that often evokes anger Sadness, devastation, confusion, accusations, rage, frustration, and perhaps worst of all, apathy. Immediately we experienced a backlash of pointed fingers and a deep need to find someone or something to blame. Vitriol flung across the internet and televised media. Sadness and feelings of hopelessness hung in the air. But we have also seen human resilience in action. Yesterday, I saw a picture taken at Harry Potter World in Orlando, at Universal Studios there, where hundreds were holding up wands, like this, to celebrate the life of fallen employee Louise Vielma, which I thought was pretty cool. So many people have donated blood, brought food, or found other ways to volunteer time and effort to ease the burden on those most deeply affected. Hotlines are opened with counselors trained in psychological first aid, uh, a group of angels made fabric wings to wear to protect the funerals from warped protesters. Uh, and charities brought comfort dogs to Orlando to spend time with those in the intensive care units. Um, a GoFundMe account collecting money for victims 
uh, does exist, and the Community Center of Orlando is orchestrating quite a bit of support. On a larger scale, Senator Chris Murphy, with the help of other senators, spent 15 hours engaged in a filibuster on the Senate floor to advocate policy action. All of this problem solving and belonging and caring relationships. These are just a few examples of individuals and communities demonstrating the capacity to adapt, to rebound, to come together in the face of adversity. Sanaya Luther, who is a key resilience researcher at Columbia University, concluded that resilience, resilience rests fundamentally on relationships. By providing support to those who have lost, we can increase the chances that individuals will be able to persevere and that communities will heal. Words by a member of the Orlando LGBTQ community, Ivo Dominguez Jr., best summarizes a resilient call to action. He said, if you want to do something about Orlando, work to change yourself and our culture, that is where real change lives. Let's start there and together demonstrate our capacity for resilience. Thank you.